So without any further ado, I will introduce Erin Robinson from the Heather and Hill Thoughts Project. Uh, welcome, Erin. Well, thanks everybody for having me. I've come from North Wales today, so before I start, my little uh, warning to you all that there's a lot of shiz and kuz in, in my talk. Um, the actual place names, some of the ones I'm talking about, are actually very, very interesting, what the Welsh translates into, so I'll talk a little bit about that today because it's really interesting as to where the place names of some of these sites come from. Um, but I work at the moment for a project called Heather and Hillforts. Um, it's been going properly um, implementation phase for about five years now. I started uh, about four and a half years ago um, and we've had a lot of funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund and project partners. So in total, the last five years, we've spent about 2.6 million in North East Wales. So as you can see here, a lot of project partners. It's a landscape partnership scheme from the Heritage Lottery Fund. There's an awful lot of people with interests in the area. So as you can see here, there's county councils, uh, CPAT is the Cluid Powys Archaeological Trust, uh, the local trust in the area. CADU, if you haven't heard of that, is um, the Welsh version of English heritage. CADU translates, just for your interest, into to keep, and that's what they do. They keep some of our properties. Um, and the Royal Commission for Wales, uh, which um, I know your Royal Commission in England is now uh, with English heritage. Um, just down at the bottom here is um, the Brunei Cluids, the Cluidian Range and D Valley AOMB. AOMB stands for Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. It's a designated area, um, just kind of one step down. Um, it's very different to um, a national park. So the project area I'm talking about today, as you can see here, um, is in North East Wales. The purple hashed areas are upland area, heather moorland, um, hence the name heather and hillforts. And the stars represent six hillforts that we have taken into um, conservation and uh, attraction in, in North East Wales. To put it in perspective, there's a little map um, up here as to where we are. Um, up on the top of the map, um, I don't have a pointer, I'm afraid, but the the little grey area at the top is uh, Prostatin and Rill. If you've ever heard of uh, Rill, uh, good old tourist resorts in, in North East Isles. Um, and maybe Llangollen, if you've heard of that, it's where the International Eisteddfod is held every year in, uh, in the south of the county. Oh, even better. <laughs> now, I feel like a schoolmistress now. <laughs> so, that's Rill, um, and then Prostatin's just next to it. Um, and then just to the right-hand side, we've got the Wirral Peninsula. So we're right on the borderlands, basically. Thank you for my pointer. So the six hill forts that we look after, um, some of them are in private ownership, some of them are on um, common land, uh, some of them are within the country park of Moyle Van Mai, which is the, the highest peak of the Cluidian Range. Um, the six hill forts, as you can see here, five of them uh, covered in heather moorland, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, but the one on the top left-hand corner is Caerdrewin, uh, Caer meaning fort. And it's actually quite unique in the area because it's actually made out of dry stone walls rather than earth and ramparts. Um, I'll go through the hill forts one by one later on, but they range um, in size. Uh, one of them about the size of maybe an acre, uh, which is the one on the the bottom here, that's Moyle Gair, um, and then we've got Penaclothiae on the right hand side, which is one of the largest hill forts in Wales. Um, from the bottom up to the top, you can see the path running through the middle, that's actually half a mile. And if you walked, if you were to walk all the way around the ramparts, that would be a mile in circumference. So it's, it's a biggie, really. Um, so I'll come back to, uh, to these in a second. But just to, to do the first part of the talk, which I'll kind of skim over, because now I'm here with archaeologists and historians and, and heritage people. Um, we're talking about the, the Heather Moorland, part of the Heather and Hillforts project. Heather is actually incredibly rare. We're blessed with it around the, the area we're in today as well. But actually, around half of the world's Heather Moorland is located in the UK. So if you imagine how tiny the UK is in the world, and we have half of the Heather Moorland in the world, that's... that's you know, we're very lucky to have it. Um, it's very rare. Um, after World War II, when there was agricultural improvement, they wanted to get more crops growing, and they needed timber, so a lot of Forestry Commission land went up the, the, the forest you see. Um, a lot of the heather moorlands disappeared, about 40% after World War II actually disappeared in Britain. Um, but the stripes you can see, and I noticed quite a lot on my way up here today going over the, um, the Peak District, 
Um, it's actually done by humans. It's human intervention is needed for Heather Morland to survive. So we burn and cut it. So this is what these strips are. It's actually done on purpose. Um, some people have different theories as to what they are before we tell them. Uh, one theory is alien landing strips. Um, but they're actually done um, to help inspire the growth of the heather. If you actually burn heather, the seeds germinate and kind of pop, and it helps it to grow back. And it actually needs this intervention, otherwise it would die away um, and revert to, to woodland. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's a really good um, biohabitat for lots of different species, which I'll get onto in a second including the sheep, which I've put on my, my top right-hand corner there. Um, this area is grazed by local graziers. Um, it's very, very important for agriculture. And these strips also let um, the sheep walk the mountain uh, an awful lot better. They like eating the young shoots. Um, so they, the, the, the strips of, of different patchwork of, of different lengths of heather actually help the sheep get around too. And then they get... Well, some farmers actually say that if they're going to put a piece of lamb in their freezer rather than sell it, they will choose one that's actually been up on the heather moorland because it tastes better. So we're, we're currently working towards a scheme in North East Wales now where we try and kind of promote that a lot more. Um, and the heather, there's three different types. Um, this is common heather, also called ling. Um, but the stripes are also coming for another reason, as well as um, wildfire control. As we know, unfortunately, we get a lot of wildfires. Um, these actually act as a fire break as well. Um, so this is Moil Vamai. Uh, Moil Vamai loosely translates into... Uh, Mother Mountain. It's a very nice name. It's the highest peak in the Cluidian range and it's uh, 1,818 feet. And on the top is a place where a lot of people think it's a castle, but it's actually uh, a tower that was built 200 years, had its 200th anniversary last year. Um, it was built for the Golden Jubilee of George III and originally was a very, very large Egyptian style kind of monolith, um, but unfortunately, uh, like the king, was kind of short lived in its. its uh, Finery and that blew down in a storm about 50 years after it was built. Um, but it was built by public script subscription and to celebrate that obviously people have there's something special about this hill. People admired it, they wanted to build something on top of it. It's seen for miles, um, including uh, Liverpool and the northwest. We have an awful lot of visitors around two, 200 to 250,000 visitors every year up to the summit. Um, there's even a, a close in Liverpool called Moyle Van My View. It's the first mountain you see when you're in Merseyside. Um, so this is what it used to look like. Um, so at the moment we're working on reconsolidation work at the tower to, um, to try and make it safe and more accessible as well for the people who do want to visit it. But this little fella is a black grouse. Um, it's one of the rarest birds in, in North Wales. Um, it's called in Welsh a grigia thi, which translates as a black heather chicken. Um, lovely little characters, but very, very rare. Um, and these strips in the moorland actually help them, um, again, to, to survive. Um, the males, as you can see here, he's doing a lek, so his big white tail feathers are stretched out, um, and they do a funny little dance called the lek to attract the females in the springtime, and they come out around dawn. Um, but they like these strips of heather, like a little arena for the females to watch and choose who's uh, top dog, if you like. Um, <laughs> As I say, they're, they're a funny bird, they come out at dawn, um, but because we want to check if the management's actually working, we also get up before dawn and get up onto the mountain. So in springtime at about three o'clock, we get out of our beds and kind of shuffle up into the heather and hide so we can actually count them and see how the management's doing. Around 10 years ago, there were only two of these up on the, the uplands in North East Wales of the Cluidian Range, and now last year, 26 were counted, so we know something good's happening. So that's the heather side of things. I'll concentrate more on the archaeology now, because I know that's why you're all here. So I'll start from the north um, in the Cluidian Range. There are actually six hill forts on the Cluidian Range itself, um, but we have got four on the Cluidian Range and two in the, the Dee Valley area. Uh, so this is Penaclothii, one of the largest in Wales, as I was saying before. Um, this aerial view from the Royal Commission really shows it off to its finery. Uh, the ramparts itself, I'm sure you're all aware of how hill forts were built. The ramparts are the big banks and ditches that surround the hill fort. Offers Dyke Path National Trail goes straight through the middle of it. That's what the line is. But, and again, it has a lot of visitors every year. But one of my jobs has been to provide provide more information about it. So if people are up there walking, they can actually find out what they're walking through. But it is so big that when you're actually standing in the middle, you can't see from one side to another. So when we get back to, to Hillforts, and we'll talk about Hillforts a lot, um, what 
are they? What are they for? Um, these are a lot of questions that we can't really answer, um, as a lot of you will know. Um, I'm going to refer to them as the Celts, um, just for ease. Um, I know a lot of, there's a lot of uh, background uh, debating to go on about using the word Celts. In Key Stage 2 in, uh, in Wales, uh, they study the Celts. So the, when you're talking to children, I call them the Celts. So we know that they didn't have a written language, um, so we can't really go off maybe what the Romans said. They were the victors. They wrote the history. I think they were probably a little bit biased. Um, I don't know if they did run around naked, but um, if they did, they were pretty good at it. And if they were able to build something as sizable as this and go from one end, possibly round, and join it up again at the other side, something was going on that we, we don't know about. They weren't barbarians. Um, they were actually very, very clever people. Um, to actually get this project in place, it would have had to have had a lot of people up there to, uh, to actually take on this feat of engineering, really, um, around two and a half thousand years ago. I'll say that the Kilfoots generally date to the Iron Age, um, but I'll get on to some more dates later on. Um, some of the dates in Cheshire are actually coming back at late, late Bronze Age hill forts now. We've been able to do topographic surveys, which I'll go through in a second, um, but we have been able to pick up some of the roundhouse platforms. Um, again, I say roundhouse. They're platforms for a structure. I can't necessarily say they're a house. Um, so when we've done reconstructions like this that we've used in a lot of interpretation projects, um, we've actually only put houses on sites where we think they probably were on. Um, so this is as close as we can get to it at, this, at the moment. Um, we've done a lot of, as well as topographical surveys, we've done geophysical surveys. So on the left-hand side, you can see here, this is just a small stretch that we've done around the pond. Panaclavia is only one of the two hill forts in the area that actually has a natural spring. Um, again, this brings up questions about hill forts. Well, if they didn't have, have springs, did they really live up there? If they are places, the fortresses, would they have uh, been able to have been besieged if they didn't have a water source? We don't really know. Panaclavia, yes. Um, and we can see here that around the, the edges uh, of the interpretation, which is of the geophysical survey, again, this is always an interpretation, um, but the high areas of, of anomalies, uh, possibly the one, um, the one just here, um, looks like maybe um, a hearth. And then we can actually see another anomaly going around this hearth, which is actually set into somewhere the, the topographical survey picked up as well just here, um, to suggest that there was a house there. The other thing that was noted as well was this little circular area, the little circular area there, which could potentially be a little yard that's attached onto the actual house itself. And these are all dotted around the lake, the little pond site there. Um, in total, from the topographical survey so far, we've counted around 90 hut platform sites. So this is a place where there are lots going on. I can't say that all of the huts were occupied at the same time. I can't say that they're all for the same use, but they were there. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention was an excavation we had in 2008 and 2009 at a Bronze Age burial mound. Um, we weren't sure if it was a Bronze Age burial mound because it's on the point where three parishes meet, so it could have been a boundary marker, um, also potentially an OS site um, uh, marker as well. Um, but there was a little very low-lying mound, and this is where the Office Dyke Path National Trail goes straight through it. So we thought, if it is something, it's getting eroded away, we need to have a look and check so we, we can see if we can um, help what's left survive. So you can see here the archaeologists at work. Um, 2008 was just an evaluation trench, so just a small thing. Um, and the only thing we found were three little stones um, kind of pointing up like this. And the first thing we thought, well, kissed, possibly. Um, so that meant that Kadu, who granted us the permission to dig, uh, were able to let us back the next year and do a larger trench to see if we could look a bit further to determine if this was man-made, geological, what was it exactly. Um, when we actually did the, the larger trench, we found um, a big hole. So um, basically, it was a very, very nice square cut hole, uh, which suggests that somebody had been there before. Uh, we also found uh, bits of clay pipe and glass. So we're thinking that the lovely old antiquarians had been there um, and had a look for treasure. 
but that gives us an idea that if they were looking for treasure, they thought it was something. And if this is before the erosion, they kind of knew where to dig. They searched out these kind of places. Um, so they came in looking for treasure. Uh, the other thing we found was also the way it had been built. It certainly wasn't geological. We could see where the kind of turfs had been stacked up, as you would imagine a, a burial mound would have been built. So we're 99% sure it's Bronze Age. Um, we can't prove it. We didn't get any dating material from it, unfortunately. Um, but in its place, to protect what's there, we built this uh, reconstruction on top to protect what, what it does lie beneath that we didn't excavate. Um, and we've put some interpretation there to say it's reconstructed. Um, so a lot of people, when they're walking past, now know what they're looking at. Um, but... Although this is a megalithic conference, I wanted to talk to you something that's actually more historical and uh, a lot more further towards us in time. When they were excavating the barrow, um, there was a walker's ken on top. We all know walker's kens. There's something in apes within us that means that we have to put a stone on top of a hill. I don't know what it is, but we've all got that feeling where we like to leave our mark. Um, but when they were actually taking this ken off to get to the turf so they could they could deturf the area, um, they found quite a few different stones that were um, written on, which again, people do. They write their names on and leave it up there. Um, but when looking under this, uh, this stone that I've got up on the screen, um, under light, we could tell what it said. And, and the words were, Carlisle D. Chamberlain, Canadian Army, Prospect, Kentucky, USA. Um, I think I'll just point out the USA for you. So if you can work, make that out. Um, so we were able to look up his records um, and see exactly what on earth Carl L. D. Chamberlain was doing up on Penacle of the I. Hillfort. Um, and we were able to bring up his army records and find that he was stationed at Kimmel Camp, which is, uh, I don't know if any of you know, Bodlewithan Castle, um, which is just off the E55, the, the main kind of motorway in Wales, um, stationed just there in World War I. So we put out a press release, which the BBC picked up, and then the Canadian press then picked up the BBC's article. And a few weeks later, we had an email from his great-grandson um, saying, oh, that's my granddad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is typical of him. Um, if, he, if he'd have known there was an, uh, kind of a, an ancient fort upon that hill, his afternoon off, he'd have been up there. Um, he, he loved it, apparently. Um, so he was able to send us um, a picture of Carl L.D. Chamberlain. He was also able to fill us in on what an extraordinary gentleman he was, um, as apparently, again, the mystery of if he's in the Canadian Army but he's from Kentucky, what on earth is going on there? But it turns out he was so passionate about fighting for his country, he was actually too young to fight in the war. So he legged it over the border to Canada, lied about his age, and then got posted over here. Um, so a very brave young gentleman indeed. He survived the First World War and went back to America. Um, and then by the time World War II comes around, um, he's too old to fight. So he lies about his age again and gets posted out. Um, so an incredible gentleman um, survived the Second World War and then went back to America and became a curator of a museum. I just think that's a wonderful story. To say we were looking for something maybe 4,000 years old, the story of 100 years ago, um, is actually just a lovely, amazing story. So. Sorry for deviating off the prehistory for a bit, but I like to share that story with people. We'll move slightly further south now onto Moilasa Hillfort. Um, the U in Welsh we, we pronounce as an E, but if you wrote, saw it written down, Moilasa, um, there are, as there are everywhere, lovely little legends about King Arthur knocking around in the area. Um, but the Hillfort itself is actually, these guys are actually stood on Penaclothiae Hillfort. This is where their school group I took up for a walking festival. Um, but Moilath is just in the distance, just, just there. And that actually shows you how close these two Hillforts are to each other. It's under two miles as the crow flies between each other. You can wave to each other, basically. Um, but they're very, very different. Moilatha is one of the smaller hill forts, um, but the actual ramparts, the banks and ditches, are absolutely massive. Um, so it looks more like a defensive place if, if it was to be one. This, again, aerial shot shows you, again, from the Royal Commission, uh, shows you Moilatha a bit closer up, looking over to Penaclothiae, which is Penaclothiae just there. Um, so they are incredibly close. Oops. Um, this is another aerial shot, and it just shows you how, how big the hill fort is. Um, 
it's got a, a little entrance here, and then on the northern ramparts, um, it's actually by phthalates. It's got two sets of ramparts. Um, it's on a less of a slope, so it looks like they needed more defence. Um, so um, from the topographical survey, we were able to see that actually it came in phases, and the outer circuit was the earliest formed, and it goes all the way around. Um, and then as a second phase, uh, they built another arm on um, just here to make it more defensible or make it more showy. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, but all of the hill forts in the area um, also, well, most, they all have an interned entrance. Um, so it's where the ramparts actually kind of go in towards the hill fort itself and make a kind of funnel-like entrance. Again, it could be either showy or it's... Um, about control, basically, who's coming in, who's going out of the hill fort. They have to go through this funnel entrance. Um, but one of the interesting things about these ones in the area in particular, especially the marches of Wales and northeast Wales, so, um, if you can just see these little crevices, these little interned, um, like semicircular shapes within the intern, um, that is interpreted a name that we call them as guard chambers. Um, they're very, very common in this area, but not common really further outside of this particular stretch of, of where the hill forts are. Um, so something's going on there where are they in touch with each other, perhaps? Um, are they keeping up with the Joneses? Another one, travelling architect going around saying, oh, well, Penaclothi over the way has got a, got a guard chamber. I think you'd better catch up with them. Um, so you do see these, these uh, kind of spread out across North East Wales and the Welsh marches. I want to say guard chamber as well. That's the name they're given. I can't say that they had a guard in them. Um, they could have, there's a lot of different interpretations, especially looking at anthropology, as to what they could have been for. And that's later quarrying. Incidentally, there was a, a Kilken, Kilken's the local village, Kilken Gold Rush, because um, they found a little nugget of gold, but it never came to anything. But you see a lot of uh, little quarry scoops in the area. Uh, moving down south a little bit further, this one is different again. Uh, this is called Moila Gair as well. You'll hear me use the, use the word Moila Gair a lot. Moila Gair, Kair, it translates as Hill of the Fort, basically. So they say what it is on the tin. Um, this is actually on a spur rather than on the main ridge of the Cluridine Range. Um, and it's actually overlooked by Moil Vamai. That's the mother mountain that I was uh, mentioning earlier on. Um, and it's, it's an, again, an interesting one. It's overlooked. It's on a spur. It might not be as defensive as the others, but it is very elaborate. A little reconstruction there. Um, the entranceway here, you can see, rather than just the intern, it's actually got a dog leg turned to it to get in. Um, so it's, 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 again, a bit more showy. Um, and it's got an annex to it as well. Um, but when we were doing geophysical survey up there, we found an area of intense burning, which you can see in the, the red um, little area on the geophysical survey, really intense burning. And then this lump of material that we see looked like vitrified rock. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the vitrified hill forts of Scotland. It's where they burn the actual banks to such an intense heat, actually the same temperature that you would need to smelt iron. Um, and we think it was to to make it more st stable or to strengthen the ramparts. Not really known of in Wales at all, so we got very excited. Um, or it could have been where an earlier entrance was, um, just a normal intern like the other places, and possibly had been burnt down, whether in attack or it's just the, the quickest way to get rid of them to build the new one. So Bank University came in. Incidentally, this came out of a sheep scrape, this piece of material. So there's a lot of erosion going on on the hill forts, but um, this lump of vitrified material came out of this where the sheep had nuzzled in to get warm. Um, so we were able to get in Bang University, uh, which is another um, place where I work, um, to excavate the area to see if, what was going on there. Um, and they were able to find that um, there wasn't an earlier entrance there, but there was an awful lot of metal iron slag, and this is where the high readings were coming from. Um, and it had actually been brought up from a different site, um, so they're suggesting, they've, um, the professor, Ray Karl, is from Austria, um, so he knows a lot about the European hill forts as well, um, was suggesting that it could have been brought up from an earlier site that they used to live in when, when building the forts, almost like a ritual practice, taking the old to build the new. We were also able to get a radiocarbon date, 
we don't have many of them in the area. Um, so we're able to date it um, to 800 to 500 BC. So we are going back around two and a half thousand years. But further, further south to Moilvenshi, Moilvenshi Hill Fort, again, is a very, very large hill fort, the other one that has a spring in it. Um, and the spring in the centre is also surrounded by earthworks where they look like they've actually made little gullies um, to, um, to make the structure of the, the pond, keep it full, I don't know. Um, and again, where the roundhouses are located are, are some of the, the topographical hut platforms that we brought up. Um, it's also very near to Moila Gaia Shambeda that I was telling about, where Bang University um, dug. Um, that's Moila Gaia Shambeda, and this one is Moil Venshi. Um, it has been suggested that it was Moila Gaia, which is a lot smaller, an outpost of Moil Venshi. Um, until we dig, if we ever do, we probably won't because it's not under pressure, um, we, we won't find out if they're even dated to the same period. But it's one theory, but they're again very, very close to one another. I'm rushing through these incidentally because uh, I don't want to make you all late, so I'm going to try and do my talk in extra quick time. Um, this is another Moila Gair, so Hill of the Fort, and this is um, above Shangoshen. Um, so this is on the San Cecilia Mountain, so it's part of the D Valley area of the, the area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, the big scar you can see running through the middle is one of the major things we've had to tackle within the project. It's unfortunately done by illegal off-road use. Um, this is common land, this is an area, a triple SI, a, a site of special scientific interest, um, and unfortunately it's a place where a lot of uh, naughty cyclists, they're not all naughty, we've been working with them, um, they've been very, very helpful, but the naughty ones unfortunately have been going illegally off-road and going straight through the hill fort. Um, this was taken in the 1950s and unfortunately since then it's got worse. Um, there's actually a, a figure of eight circuit, um, which might be on my next slide, um, just to the uh, west, west of the hill fort where they'd actually got down to bedrock, that's how many times they'd gone round. So it's under a lot of pressure. Um, we wanted to have a look into the hill fort to see if, if the archaeology is close to the surface, that means it's under a lot of uh, pressure, it, you know, it could disappear with just one bike going round really. Um, so Caddy granted us to, um, to have an excavation up there as well. The reconstruction. Um, but first of all, obviously, you want to know where you're going to dig, so we did a geophysical survey of the area, and this is what came up. So to say it's only a tiny hill fort, it's the smallest in the area, um, we found the blue strip along the middle is the off-road track, um, and you can see an awful lot of circles where potential houses were. Um, also, interestingly, um, a rectangular structure potentially there as well, which um, made us smile as to whether there was something there because that could mean one of two things either going earlier than the Iron Age or, or possibly um, closer to us um, into the medieval and we were hoping it was earlier um, so we put a trench across where the two round houses um, overlap um, to see if we could get for our small trench that we were allowed to do to see if we could get the majority of the, the knowledge and the stratigraphy um, nope, that's my next hill fort. Um, so basically, we did find um, the hill, the, the sorry, the round houses from their drip gullies. So where the roof would have gone down, the conical roof, uh, there would have been a drip gully surrounding it to catch the the water. And we were able to find them, and they were very, very close to the surface. So it, it was under a lot of threat. Um, but they also overlapped each other. So we know that there was different phases of use at this place as well. One was built before the other. So my final hill fort in the area is Kaidroin. Kaidroin, as I said earlier, is a very interesting hill fort because it's actually made out of stone. The other ones are made out of earthen banks and ditches, but this is actually on a limestone outcrop of the geology. The others are on a kind of a, a kind of a shaley hillside, which I don't know if you've ever dug in the air, in, you know in a kind of shale. It's kind of slaty. It doesn't make good building material, but the limestone comes out in nice big blocks, so it makes a nice dry stone wall. Incidentally, the farmer also thought that made nice dry stone walls too a few hundred years ago, and so a lot has been robbed to make nice dry stone walls in the area. But uh, there's still a lot left, as you can see. You can see quite clearly the interned entrance here, um, and also another annex, um, and also a lovely little roundhouse foundation here. Um, 
Another thing that I'll point out, because I don't know if you'll be able to see from there, but uh, the little holes that go along, like little craters in the hill. Um, these are obviously built into the collapsed hill fort. So it, they've been built after the hill fort's actually been used. Um, but they were mentioned in in the 1800s by an antiquarian, but weren't mentioned in the 1700s. So we can roundabout date it to, you know, within 100 years, perhaps, of when they were used. But this time, I think the hill fort was under the local estate, um, and it was very good for grouse shooting. So we think there might be grouse butts, but it's, again, part of the history of the site, so it's worth mentioning. Um, I'll just show you a quite quick reconstruction. So it actually, it's slightly tipped hill forts, and it's located at the place where three valleys meet. Um, so it's possible um, that this is a place where people came to. It's tipped up, so you can see really well into the hill forts. So it's possibly a place where you want to see, rather than being shrouded and, you know, you can't see past the walls. Um, we've done, well, Oxford University have done some geophysical survey up there. And although the geology, it's really close to the surface, so it's hard to see, but we haven't really picked up many hut platforms. So there's a possibility that there was, this wasn't necessarily built for occupation, but something else. During the topographical survey, we were able to see that um, there were lots of different phases of activity. This first um, reconstruction shows uh, a ditch and a bank. Um, now, this ditch and bank you can actually see from the air. So you can see the bank running, uh, sorry, the ditch running along here, and then the bank actually runs along and has been built upon by this annex. Um, but from the topographical survey, we were able to see that the ditch terminal actually came out the other side. The stone wall's been built on top of it, that means that the ditch, came, ditch and bank came before. Um, the next phase was the hillfort proper this big dry stone wall with two entrances, both in turned again. Um, but this might have had another uh, semi-building uh, phase to it because the top half um, around there um, is actually made out of just dry stone wall. And we can also still see there, um, as for uh, thanks to antiquarians again helping in the early 1900s, um, they've been able to show um, or they, they've taken away bits of the tumble-down material, so the actual dry stone walling that was built in the Iron Age you can actually see, and it's beautiful, it's very, very well made. Um, but then the, the bottom half is actually made out of a dry, sorry, um, an earthen bank with tumble-down stone around it. Um, so we think that this is actually built completely differently to the top half. We don't know why, whether they run out of material perhaps. Um, it's local stone, they've got it from the hillside itself. Um, so they've actually got an earthen bank with maybe a dry stone outer face to make it look like it's a, a dry stone wall the whole way around. And then the third phase we can see there's the annex and we can date this potentially because there's an old legend about Drewin itself, it's this Kai Drewin. Drewin was a giant and he built a little enclosure about an acre where his love could milk her cows. Um, so this dates back to, um, again, the phrase I'm going to use is dark ages. I know that's not the, the general term anymore, but it gives you an idea. Um, so we think this was actually built post-Roman. The village of uh, Corwen that's down the slopes um, has actually got Roman occupation in it. So it's possible that this was used in prehistory. Romans came along, built the village, and then when the Romans went away, they maybe came back up here. This is my thing that I really, really want to talk to you about, though. This is my baby, which is called the Hillfort Glow. It's loosely based on my PhD research, which I'm doing with Bangor University, um, but also with my job kind of reconnecting the community with their local hill forts. Um, it was inspired by an MA by Dave Matthews, um, who looked into indivisibility of hill forts in the area. As you'd have seen, the six that I've been talking about today, they're all very close together. In my study area itself, which uses a 30-mile radius around the Cluidian Range, um, in my study area in itself, there's 109. So we've got an awful lot of hill forts in, in North East Wales and, and the borders. Um, we've also got a sister project called Habitats and Hill Forts. I'm from Heather and Hill Forts. Um, and they look after six Iron Age hill Iron Age, Late Bronze Age hill forts as well. They're actually getting dates. We haven't really had many dates. Um, so we wanted to see how, and this is what my research on, how on earth did they all live together? Were they built at the same time? What were they for? These are all questions that we still have. Um, we don't have the written language. 
in North East Wales as well, um, which is maybe one of the questions that comes up a lot, um, we don't really have that many artefacts either, unfortunately. The soil is very acidic in the uplands, so bone and iron generally just disappear. They erode away. Um, they didn't use coins in this area until very, very, very late on, um, coming up to the Roman period. And um, they didn't use pottery either. So all we have usually is a thing called VCP, which stands for very coarse pottery. Um, very, very technical archaeological term. Um, so, you know, it looks like mud. It's not great. It was used for containing salt. Um, so we know that we were in connection with Cheshire, the lovely uh, salt salty places down there and they were they were bringing it up um, but as for artifacts we, we don't really have much so we've got no artifacts we've got no written language um, and really haven't really dug that many places either um, so it's you know it's something we certainly wanted to find out more about so the Hillfort Glow um, was inspired by the Hadrian's Wall event. I don't know if you saw that a few years ago, which was uh, lighting up the wall with beacons every half a mile or something. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to see if we could get people up to the top of these hill forts um, at dusk with torches to see if we could um, signal to one another, basically. Um, again, I'm not saying that the hill forts were definitely all used at the same time for the same reason, but we know that they can a lot of them could see each other and how far we could see I wanted to find out to see if there was any connection between them. Um, so, oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. These are the, the six hill forts in, on the Cheshire Sandstone Ridge that I was talking about in our sister project. Um, Frodsham, I don't know if you know the M56, that's the one that goes, once you're out of Wales, you get onto the M56 towards Manchester. Um, Beeston Castle, lovely English heritage site, that used to be a hill fort as well before the, um, the lovely stone castle was built. And these sites are now getting radiocarbon dates very, very early. Uh, they've had a lot of excavation there as part of their heritage lottery funding money was for training digs. So they've been able to go, go up and, and get a lot of information about them. This vista, or these vistas I should say, are taken from a hill fort called Moila Gaia Trosses Mod on Halkin Mountain. Um, it's one of the more famous hill forts, I'd say. Um, it was dug by Graham Gilbert in the 70s um, before a reservoir was put in on top, and they found an awful lot of, of archaeology, a lot of different phases, one of which, the most recent phase, um, was actually only just visible because they actually built the houses on kind of uh, sleepers rather than put it into the ground, so they could only just see a trace of where these buildings had been, had been put because also when they left, maybe one generation, um, after they left the site, they took the wood with them, so you could only just see where the archaeology had been. Um, but if you haven't ever looked it up, look, please do look it up. It's, it's an amazing site. But from here, you can actually see the top um, area shows this Cheshire Stansone Ridge. I'll point out Beeston Castle. See that little bump there? It looks like an island. Um, and along here are the six Cheshire Hill Forts. And then here is the Cluidian Range, really very prominent in the landscape. Um, this is Moyle Arthur. You can tell by its little conical shape. Um, Moyle Van Mai is the one with the, the dimple on top. And then just to its left is Moyle Venshi, and further up is, is Penacothiae. So from here we can see a lot of hill forts. Um, we wanted to see exactly how far we could stretch it. So at dusk, we got a, a range of volunteers up. Um, we did limit it to 30 at most sites, because obviously we're going up in the dark. Um, they're not very easy things to get up if you've ever walked hill forts before, let alone in the dark, with potentially 30 volunteers as well. Um, Moira Gaira is actually very easy to get up. Um, so we amalgamated our walk with a, a local walk from the pub, and uh, we had about 100 people up there, which is amazing. So this is from Cadro in the Stonehill Fort um, down in the south of the project area looking over to the Cluidian Range. So you can just see exactly how, how prominent these hills are. Um, and this is taken from, uh, I think this is Moyle Arthur or Panaclothiae, looking down towards, you can see Moyle Vamai again, the one with the pimple on top. Um, and the light in the sky is actually a flare we sent up before actually starting to switch on the torches, um, just so people could get their eye in um, as, as it was getting dark. Obviously, it's harder to see the silhouette of the hills. Um, and then they started um, flashing their lights. Um, I've got to be careful what I say, actually, because we did a, a quick test run with a couple of the hill forts uh, with a few colleagues, and we had walkie-talkies to talk to each other. Um, and I think I, well, my colleague Nick, in a very gruff warden's voice, uh, was talking into the, 
into the radiator, one of our colleagues saying, I'm flashing at you now. And uh, we scared a dog walker to bits, I think. The poor thing, she started walking very, very quickly away from us. Um, so we, we, we quickly decided not to call it flashing. Um, but basically, this is all we had. We had people up there with torches. Uh, we had what we call newt torches. We use them for great crested newt count. They're very, very, very strong, like the million candle watt torches. Um, and we were able to actually signal to one another. It, it, was, uh, it was amazing, actually. Um, this is a site from one of the Cheshire Hill forts, and it just shows you kind of what, if we all get together and, and build this light, um, how much of a, a dramatic uh, show it, it, it shows. Um, the, I'll go to the next slide, actually. The, um, the actual flashing, uh, switching on and off of torches was able to get us to pinpoint the areas um, to 10 different hill forts, uh, five of which were in Wales and five in, well, four in Cheshire and one on the Wirral Peninsula, which is now just a bank. It's been quarried away quite dramatically. Um, but we were able to actually get up to 30 kilometres away between the two hill forts. The thing that actually um, distracted us, but also it made the night even more special, was the fact that it was the night of the supermoon. Um, we actually did it in March in the end because of the snow in December. Um, so up in the, the east, the moon rose over Beeston Castle, and it was this huge pink colour. Um, it was at its closest to, to Earth as it had been in so many years, and it was really quite dramatic. And you, you could actually stand up there, kind of taking yourself back in time, thinking, yeah, they might have seen this too. It was pretty special, and it was something that we couldn't have planned. We couldn't plan the weather. We couldn't plan how many people came up, necessarily. People just came. Um, but this is something that really shocked us all and actually took away a little bit from the event we were doing. Um, but it just stopped us in our tracks to, to look. But another thing that we got from the event um, was the feeling of community, from going from one hill fort in Wales over to one hill fort in Cheshire, and basically with light, being able to wave at each other, really had a sense of community together. We felt like we were neighbours, really. So I'm not necessarily saying that they signalled to one another in the Iron Age. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that they were all built at the same time or for the same reason. But I am saying that if they were in existence at the same time, they would have certainly been aware of each other. And that feeling that we got um, was, you know, there were over 300 volunteers. We all shared the same feeling. Um, so it was very, very dramatic for that, definitely. But this picked up a lot of press, which I was very happy about, because I like sharing my hill forts with people. Um, <laughs> my hill forts, I shouldn't say that. They're not mine. Um, we were able to um, do radio interviews over, all over the world, um, to Australia, um, New Zealand, um, Canada and America, um, and also the one that just top the pace for me was Radio 4. I was very excited about that. That's where the Arches is on. I like the Arches. Um, so yeah, it was amazing to actually do these interviews to people that were actually really interested in what we had to say about the places. Um, and it really, really made it special. Um, something that some people could, could have said was, well, you know, if you're encouraging lots of people up to these hill forts, what about the erosion? We've already seen that from the, the burial mound on Panaclothiae. Um, but something we've put in place are things called floating footpaths, where a traditional countryside management company have come up and built footpaths on um, the ramparts um, over the, the footpaths that were being used. Not, nothing goes into the ground. They're actually built on site. The wood is cut in site to go into the contours of the hillside itself, um, and they actually just kind of sit on top of it, so it's actually preserving the archaeology underneath, and that means we can encourage people up there um, to go and visit the sites as well. So that was a whistle-stop tour. I tried to keep it quite quick, so I apologise if I was talking quite quickly, because um, I don't want to keep you any later than, than that. Um, but I just want to say that the, the hill forts themselves, they're still shrouded in mystery. Um, my research with Bangor is actually going on for a few more years yet, trying to connect all of these hill forts up, looking at their architecture. Um, are they built in the same way? We look at the guard chambers and the interned entrances. We're getting dates from around the area, from Cheshire and from our own hill forts themselves. Um, there's more hill forts on the Cluidian Range. Moyle Haradhig um, is in the north near Dizeth, which is just near Rill. And that's actually been quarried away by a third, um, unfortunately, in the 70s and 80s. But that meant they were able to go up and excavate beforehand. And again, put more bits and pieces to the jigsaw. Um, incidentally, I should have put this as a slide, I do apologise, um, but in, when they were first putting in the road for the quarry, they came across some um, amazing metalwork, um, copies of which are now in the National Museum of Wales. Um, so beautiful shields, uh, lovely 
boss, which is the Laten style, so kind of late Iron Age. So we know that these people are not only communicating with Cheshire um, through the, the VCP, the, the salt, um, and they were able to see each other, um, but also possibly the whole of Europe. Um, we're on a coastal area as well, possibly uh, trading with, with Euro Europeans. Um, also, I don't know if you'll ever get the chance to go to Wales. Um, if you're in North Wales for the next couple of months, we've actually got the Llyn Cerig Bach Horde, um, which is a, an Iron Age horde found on Anglesey. Um, hopefully all of you have heard of uh, Valley RAF. If you haven't, it's where Prince William is, so that helps you remember. Um, when they were actually building the run strip, the runway for the, the aeroplanes, um, they would... Uh, digging up some lovely peaty areas to make it nice and springy for the runway um, and came across this metalwork hoard. At first they didn't know what it was, they just found this big chain um, and the tractor got stuck so they used this chain to actually pull out the tractor out of the, the boggy area um, and it was very very strong and it worked very well but then they found lots more things such as um, bits of chariots, a trumpet, um, shields and things like that um, and now, now for the next couple of weeks that's actually on display in Anglesey so if you do get a chance to go across please do otherwise go down to Cardiff and check it out because um, as I say there's not many places in, in North Wales that we have Iron Age artefacts um, these areas are, are quite unique. Moel Haravik, the one where the shields came up, um, that's again limestone, so it makes the, the soil a li little bit more acid uh, sorry, less acidic, more alkaline, and, and it helps preservation. Um, so it's really, really worth, worth a look. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to come back to you in a few more years' time and tell you what my research has found out um, and give you a bit more than possibly's and probably's in my presentation. <laughs> but that's it from me for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Eric. It's very interesting. Uh, we've got time for one quick question. Do you think there's anyone wanting to? Oh, yeah, go ahead. You know the Floridian range, uh, the last one, the last four, the stone one. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned some, was it a medieval tale or something about the cow, cow milk? Is that the, the basis of you making the decision that it was an addition, an addition later, or is there any scientific evidence that it was an addition later, the, the, the annex? Yeah. Um, the annex at Kajrowin, um, again, Kajrowin has never, as far as we know, has actually been dug, so we haven't got any scientific dates for it. Yeah. All we can go on is the topographical information that we've got. When I first saw it, I mm. thought that's where they kept the goats. Well, that's, it's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll just go back to the picture of that, actually, because it's, it's a possibility. The thing that kind of gets in the way, but by no means means it's, it's any different, is there's actually no entrance way into the hill fort from the enclosure. So they'd have had to have left the hill fort to then get in. You can see just here the little entrance way into the annex, but nothing, there's no break into the walls itself. So it almost, it is an addition. We know that it's later than the hill fort, but yes, I can't say exactly when um, it could have been a, a little stock enclosure, but we think um, that it's actually, well, we, we can see that it abuts um, just in this area here. We can see that it's actually being built onto the hill fort. As I say, I can't tell you when. The only reason we've gone for the, the post-Roman, really, or there's, there's a couple of different reasons, but it's um, the legend, really, that we, we come across. It's actually historically written down. Um, it's a possibility. Yeah, well, that's something I should should mention also is that we've done peat core analysis on um, in the area um, on the Cluidian range, and we know that in the Iron Age, um, some of the surrounding areas, the heather moorland is starting to come up. That I talked about earlier, but by the Iron Age, on this these these particular hills, it's still agricultural. They're, they're growing crops, so we know they were farmers for definite. Um, it's different from the rest of the areas so surrounding, so possibly that's why these hill forts were here. You know, they're protecting their currency. They didn't have coins, but they did have, as you say, agriculture, and they had crops. Were well, these hillforts here to protect this lovely arable land? It's possible to see. Okay. Anyone else? Quick question. Yep. You mentioned the greatly eroded uh, financial foot on the world. It's. Um, I'll go back to my map. It's called Burton Point. It's actually on an RSPB reserve now. Um, so you can. I think you have to go past uh, private land to get to it. Sorry. Um, but there has been a bit of research done by 
Gary Crawford Coop, um, who did his, I think it was his BA research, and so he did some great survey work of it. But all that's left really is a bank and a possible um, entrance way into it. Sorry, I didn't realise how many slides I had. Um, but yes, he's also looked into the surrounding area. Something that I'm doing as well is we've got a few um, possibly Iron Age enclosures in the valley below farmsteads. Um, so it's interesting to look at the surrounding area and see what's going on outside the hill forts as well as inside. We all know that people didn't necessarily live in the hill forts full stop. Uh, we don't know if they lived in it all year round. Um, we don't know if they just kind of lorded over the place really from the farmsteads from up there. Um, there we go. Um, so it's just, if you can see the Wirral here, whoops, um, it's basically right on the edge there. And the reason it's been eroded away is because uh, obviously when the Wirral, uh, sorry, the, the, the D um, was being used as a, a shipping area, um, it's actually silted up um, a lot since then. The river's taken a different course and they've used it a lot for quarrying as well. So a lot of it has actually gone back, 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 back further. So there's only a little bit of this I should say potential hill fort as well, we don't know for sure um, that, that it's there. Have you got time? Uh, I think we'd probably better move on, but I'll find her afterwards, and she'll, she'll, she'll be happy to. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, you do need to press on. Okay. okay. That's very, very good of you to come over. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks.